He would only play to the death. It wasn't a form of play anymore. It was all about winning. The Russians are going to really be into it when I get the title. If you can't have all-out nuclear war, you can have the World Chess Championship. But at the peak of his fame, he disappeared and self-destructed. He's shy, suspicious of strangers. But you don't understand, Harry. These Russians are against me. He said to have taken out all his gold teeth because it was a way for the Soviets to send X-ray to attack him. He resurfaced 20 years later and turned his back on his country. Well, this is all wonderful news. It's time for the f***ing U.S. to get their heads kicked in. Now, an American hero lives as a fugitive. The most famous and the most inexplicable recluse ever. I want to know why. What drove Bobby Fischer into madness? He was very close to his mother. He felt abandoned by his father. He has a paranoid delusion. He had psychopathic tendencies. I don't think he's mentally ill. He's just become rotten. Basically, people think that there's something wrong with the man. I don't think there's going to be any reclamation. This is Bobby Fischer, anything to win. The game of chess has been played by kings and presidents, artists and athletes, young and old. But professional chess never garnered much attention until Bobby Fischer. Fischer really piqued the national imagination. He was uh, charismatic, tall, handsome, somewhat uh, mysterious. He was very interesting. He was offbeat. He was unique. He was idiosyncratic. Journalists love people like him. They make headlines. Chess was not a popular game it was not part of american myth overnight bobby fisher put chess on the map of america right on thank you okay how did a high school dropout become a cultural touchstone carrying the weight of a nation and what price did he pay to get there he said i i want to become world champion i've achieved it now i don't know what to do and I think that is the crux of what happened afterwards. If you put all your time and all your efforts to become a master in a thing like, or art like chess, you sacrifice. And the question is, what is it that you sacrifice? The next question is, of course, is it worth it? To understand Bobby Fischer, one must go back to before he was born, to his mother, Regina. Regina was a brilliant woman. She studied uh, medicine in the Soviet Union in uh, the 1930s uh, under Stalin. She spoke seven languages fluently. By the time she had Bobby, she had studied in about six different universities. Because she was Jewish, Regina had fled Europe, separating from her husband, German biophysicist Hans Gerhard Fischer. She raised Bobby and his older sister Joan by herself, at one point living in a shelter for single mothers. There was a time when she considered uh, putting Bobby up for adoption and I think tearfully told a social worker uh, in Chicago that she, it's not something she wanted to go through with. When Bobby was five, his mother moved the family into an apartment in Brooklyn. His sister, Joan, bought a chess set uh, in the candy store above which they lived. He was pretty soon completely obsessed by it, so much so that his mother took him to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, well, there were more things to worry about than chess. Relax. At nine, Bobby played his first organized tournament. By 11, he was a regular in New York's chess clubs. Bobby was a chess sponge. He would walk into a room where there were chess players, and he'd sweep around, and he'd look for any chess books or magazine, and he'd sit down, and he'd just swallow them one after another, and he'd memorize everything. He decided when he was eight or nine or something that he wanted to be world champion. I was getting pretty good when I was about uh, 11. I started to feel pretty good. He said he read a thousand chess books and he absorbed the best from every one of them. I think he had the equivalent of a hundred PhDs in chess. While the rest of us were concentrating on 
school studies and sports and girls. He memorized everything that was to be known about the theory of the time. Bobby did what you had to do to become the best player in the world. Chess is a complex game with a simple objective, to capture the opponent's king. Moving pieces in concert, players try to outwit and checkmate the opposition. What chess is really about is, as well as pure calculational power, it's about a form of wisdom, it's about intuition, it's about imagining yourself forward. Bobby just could feel his way forward. At the age of 13, he played this amazing match against Donald Byrne. Extraordinary, incredible game for anybody, and for a 13-year-old, it's virtually unbelievable. First of all, it was a queen sacrifice. Queen is the strongest piece on the board, and if you give it up, you usually lose. The game is over. Hans Kmach, who was a leading chess author and analyst of the day, called it the game of the century, and title sticks to this day. When Bobby was 13 years old in 1956, we were approximately of the same strength. I was 19, and we played about equally. A year later, when he was 14, he was clearly better than I or anyone else in the United States. Age 14, he became US champion. Age 15, he became the youngest grandmaster in history. By then, everybody knew we had a genius on our hands. The amazing Bobby Fischer. He replayed for the spectators the game in which he won the U.S. National Championship. From the time he was 13 or 14, he was a celebrity. Here, chess players old and young competed against Bobby Fischer as he played 25 games simultaneously without a loss. The world approached him on his own terms, in part because he demanded it, in part because he was King Bobby. Will you tell us how old you are and where you're from? I'm 15, I'm from Brooklyn. This young man's name is Bobby Fischer, and listen to this, already... He is the United States chess champion. To his mother, Bobby's gift represented an opportunity. She really tried to manipulate in many ways his career and tried to find ways to promote him. She called me up one time and said, I want Bobby to go on this certain TV station. I don't want to tell him because if I tell him, he won't do it. So I want you to tell him. One of my jobs was to raise funds for uh, players to play overseas. And she was always in my office trying to get this money. And Bobby was embarrassed by all of this. Bobby had no relationship with the man listed on his birth certificate as his father, Hans Gerhard Fischer. Occasionally I would mention something to Bobby about your, you know, your father or something, and he would say, uh, I didn't know my father, I, you know, he left when I was two. Or at least one occasion he cried when fathers was mentioned at a toast at a banquet. And I read somewhere else that if you mentioned his father, he wasn't the same for the rest of the day. What about your father? No, I don't see him. Are they living together? No, her, her. Sports writer Dick Schapp covered Bobby regularly and befriended him. My father, Dick Schapp, knew that Bobby didn't have really a father figure in his life. And I think my father filled that function, taking him to sporting events, trying to socialize him to a certain degree in a world outside of chess. But Bobby showed little interest in anything outside of the 64 squares. Although his IQ was estimated at 187, that's high genius level. It didn't translate into school success. Bobby dropped out of Erasmus High School after the 10th grade. He had made a decision to become the greatest chess player in the world. Everything else was a distraction. Here he was, a high school dropout, suddenly thrown in among highly educated people, rich people, sophisticated people. And he felt himself always at a disadvantage, and that was always a tremendous impact on all of his behavior. He, from a very early age, could sense that people were attaching their own fortunes to his. And that's naturally going to produce paranoia, even in someone who is normal, and in someone who is predisposed to paranoia or schizophrenia, it's obviously going to have disastrous effects. He was not an easy person to be with. 
Whatever he wanted to do, he wanted to do it. He didn't care about you. He sounded crazier and crazier. I told him he ought to go see a psychiatrist. He was in bad shape. By his late teens, Bobby Fischer was the top chess player in the United States, and he was already using tactics of intimidation. Chess was not for him a form of play as much as it was a sport. He trained himself to win, physically, psychologically, and in terms of his chess knowledge. He towers over you, flashing blue eyes, looking around, and if you'd make some threat which to him seemed childish, he would kind of like snicker or scoff at that. Mark Kylenoff said that he was Achilles without an Achilles heel. He, it was like a wall was advancing on you. You just felt helpless. But Bobby's success came at a price. As his chess skills improved, his social skills deteriorated. He didn't have many friends. His life became chess. Chess became his life. If you were in conversation with him over dinner, uh, you would look glance round to find that he'd taken out his pocket set uh, and was playing. Chess and me, you know, it's like it's hard to take him apart, you know. Just like my alter ego, you know. People outside of the world of chess, he would refer to them as weakies or fish. They didn't have anything to offer. What has chess done to your social life? Do you get yeah. a chance to go out? Not too much. No. Do you have a girl? No. no. He's a lonely person, and the chess gives him the companionship that he lacks. Bobby slept during the day and studied chess and listened to the radio at night. He found a captivating voice in Herbert Armstrong, founder of the Worldwide Church of God. All of the great cities are going to be leveled and destroyed. I'm telling you that a time more terrifying than anything that ever happened is soon going to happen in this world. Herbert W. Armstrong had the largest radio and TV audience in the nation in the 60s. And his son, Garner Ted Armstrong, both were very charismatic speakers, motivational type people. It was a fundamentalist sect uh, and that also had uh, Saturday as the Sabbath, which was sort of unusual for a Christian sect. After studying many religions, and I mean many, he felt that we were the closest to the truth at that time. He was hooked into it. From 1957 to 1967, he won eight U.S. championships. With each success, Bobby's ego swelled. He began to make demands, exerting control. Boards had to be so, the pieces had to be so, the audience had to be kept back from the game, the prize money had to be doubled. Conditions have been like in the dark ages, you know, horrible lighting, chandelier type lighting, when obviously if you're going to concentrate for five hours, you need the most soft, kind of <clears throat> bright type fluorescent lighting that you can get. He made life hell for tournament organizers, and a couple of times this led to showdowns and he refused to compromise. In 67, despite leading the World Championship qualifying tournament, Fisher walked out midway after a series of arguments with tournament officials. Bobby had to forfeit, so Bobby left. He played one of the great tournaments of his life and then he drops out. Because he wasn't getting his request. Once he realized he was leaving, he sent a message to the U.S. Embassy saying that he wanted a nice roomy helicopter to take him <laughs> to the airport. All the dignitaries are there, everybody's there. It's all set. There's only one person missing, Bobby Fischer. They have a way with words. <laughs> a way with fashion. A way with games. Join GSN as it counts down the greatest game show hosts of all time. Watch Game Show Countdown Top 10 Hosts. An encore presentation Tuesday at 9, 8 central only on GSN. Man has always been fascinated with traveling back in time. Well, now Sprint has actually moved the unlimited calling time back. Two hours from 9 p.m. to 7. It's science fiction meets cold, hard economics. Stupid time machine. 
Switch to Sprint and get unlimited calls starting at 7 p.m. Sprint. Power up. Sprint gives you the power to start talking at 7 p.m. Because night calling now starts two hours earlier. And with enhanced overage protection, there won't be any surprises on your bill. All with Sprint fair and flexible plans. Switch today and get the best value in wireless. Stop by your nearest Sprint store and get the A640 camera phone free. Sprint. Power up. You ever think you might have worms? If your computer is slowing down or crashing or just acting weird. E-acceleration with the full power of stop sign can make it like new again. Stop sign gives you virus protection, second to none. With a spam blocker and spyware remover. Pop-up blocker. And the stop sign firewall for all the protection you'll ever need. Guaranteed. You may be infected and not even know it. Go to StopSign.com for a free virus scan now. Every day, Progressive does something that's, well, progressive. They have this ticker that shows their car insurance rates and their top competitors. Right now on Progressive.com, you can see actual rates that people are getting. Sometimes Progressive is the lowest. Sometimes they're not. Hey, if they're this helpful when you're shopping for car insurance, imagine how they'll be once you're a customer. Did you know one in two women will develop bone or breast health issues? Really? I didn't know that. One a Day Women's is the only complete multivitamin with more calcium for strong bones and now more vitamin D, which emerging research suggests may support breast health. One a Day Women's. I'm here to talk about the Sprint Network. Assisting me is Henry Alshman, attorney. Sprint has the largest voice calling area and the largest mobile broadband network. No one has a more powerful network. It even protects us from meteors. Well, that's the word on the street. Switch to the Sprint Power Network. Buy one katana, get one free. Sprint. Power up. The World Chess Championship is a three-year cycle. The world's top players compete in a series of regional tournaments called the Interzonals until the field is narrowed to eight. In the candidates round, the final eight compete for the right to take on the reigning champ. When the cycle for the 1972 title rolled around, Bobby Fischer was at the top of his game. He easily won the interzonals, finishing with seven consecutive wins. Then, he made history. He has to play a series of candidates matches, three matches. The first one, he plays Mark Taimanov, wonderful, brilliant Soviet grandmaster. He beats him 6-0. The Soviets can't believe this. The match was over and time enough got up and said, well, I can always play the piano. <laughs> then he plays Bent Larsen, one of the great chess players as well, Danish grandmaster. He beat him six to nothing. You know, that's like knocking out Muhammad Ali with one hand tied behind your back. It can't be done. Then he plays Tigran Petrosian, smashes him as well. The chess world had never seen a series of games quite like this. Fischer earned the right to challenge the reigning world champ, 35-year-old Russian Boris Spassky. Spassky was a product of the Soviet chess machine, the Soviet school. He had training, he had support, he had everything that a chess player dreams of. The Soviets had dominated the World Chess Championship since World War II. Chess was how they proved their intellectual superiority over capitalism. The Soviets have always used chess as propaganda. Their idea was communism is the best government social system. It produces the smartest men and women, so naturally we win the world's chess championship. For years, Bobby had complained that the Soviets had conspired to retain the title. You sound a little angry when you talk about the Russians and their chess. That's right, yeah. Well, they've held my title for about 10 years. Well, I look at it. This is Bobby, the lone American hero, riding out to confront the massed ranks of the great, previously all-conquering chess machine. The Cold War showdown sparked spectacular international interest. Iceland earned the right to host by offering a record purse of $125,000. But Bobby never signed the contract and at the last moment had second thoughts. He wanted more money. This was a last-minute demand. 
and nobody in Iceland was going to meet it. I thought that Bobby Fischer would like to become the world chess champion. And I couldn't believe that he would walk away from it. This was the highest prize money ever. Thousands of fans and journalists descended upon Reykjavik. But when the opening ceremonies took place, one man was missing. There's the world champion himself, Boris Spassky. There's the American ambassador. There's the president of Iceland. There's only one empty chair, and it is, of course, the challenger. Where is the challenger? The challenger's in New York City, uh, renegotiating the agreement. If Mr. Fisher has a moral to pass on, it is that the important thing in the game is not in winning, but in getting the highest percentage of the gate money. Michael Nicholson, ITN, sitting where Mr. Fisher should have been in Iceland tonight. How far would Bobby push his demands? And would it cost him his dream? 1972 World Chess Championship began without the challenger. The championship was in peril. Then a wealthy British chess fan called Bobby out. He offers to double the prize money there and then, and he issues a challenge. Come on, chicken. If it's about prize money, come out and, pl and play. Bobby was nearly persuaded. A phone call from the U.S. government sealed the deal. Kissinger said to him something like, we, we want you to go to Iceland to win the Russians, the Soviet Union. And they told me that he was like a young warrior going to war. Bobby finally arrived in Reykjavik, but as usual, the negotiations had only just begun. Bobby goes down to the hall and he doesn't like the chessboard and he thinks the chairs of the audience are too close and he doesn't like the lighting. There isn't anything that Bobby likes and he demands that each and every one of those things is changed. We had to remove several of the first rows, take the audience further back into the hall. The conditions were met, and on July 11th, 1972, the match began. Game one's an amazing game. Bobby plays a move that club players know not to play. He takes a pawn with his bishop. A rook pawn allows his bishop to be trapped. The mistake cost Bobby the first game. Oh, I think he blundered, you know. I, I think that's pretty clear, you know. I think he was disturbed by some TV towers, you know, who were hanging over him there, you know. There was a man by the name of Chester Fox who had the camera rights, and he had to wrap the cameras in burlap. Fisher said he could hear the cameras even. He even said he heard the cameras when they weren't even turned on. Mr. Fox, yes. If it's not the noise that's fucking Mr. Fisher, what could it then be? I don't think anybody can tell you other than Bobby Fisher, and maybe he can not tell you. Bobby insisted that the cameras be removed. The Icelanders refused. Game two also went to Spassky by forfeit. He didn't show up for the second game and lost it too. The championship is a best of 24, with both players earning a half point for a draw. The first to 12 and a half points is the victor. Tremendous disadvantage. Should be behind two to nothing at the start of a match. That's five to nothing in the last inning. It's a very, very big hole. But Bobby was unwavering, and he refused to continue unless the cameras were removed. Then we decided, away with the cameras. We are not jeopardizing the mats for the cameras. They end up moving Game 3 into a tiny little room at the back, which is normally used for table tennis. And it was possibly Boris Spassky's big mistake. The Russians understood. They warned Spassky. They said, don't give in to him. Don't let him take control with his demands. Don't let it become his match, his tournament. Mr. Spassky, are you happy with the arrangements for today's game? He didn't need to agree to it. He could have stuck to his guns and Fisher would have forfeited the world championship and Spassky would have remained world champion. Instead, Bobby seized the momentum, winning game three. That was a tremendous moment because it was the first time in his life Fisher had beaten Spassky. And it also indicated to us that Spassky wasn't quite on his game. He may have been rattled by all the shenanigans that had already happened. I don't think Fisher deliberately 
played psychological games. But the effect of his demands was to psychologically destroy his opponents. He won six and a half out of his next eight games, which you just, it just doesn't make any sense against a player of Spassky's caliber. The Soviets even begin to wonder whether CIA are poisoning Spassky. They check the chairs, they take the lights apart, all they can find are two dead flies. A sample of his orange juice is flown to a KGB laboratory in Moscow for testing. They were measuring all kinds of beams and rays that could get into there. It can't be the case that Spassky is just crumbling like this in the face of Fisher's psychological onslaught. No evidence was discovered, and the match continued. I think the second half of, the, of this match, uh, there was much more of a fight somehow, you know, because Spassky had, you know, he had regained his uh, composure, he had also regained his self-confidence, you know. But game 11 would be Spassky's last victory. After seven consecutive draws, Bobby was on the verge of winning the title. Midway through the 21st game, Spassky conceded. The world championship belonged to Fisher. What does it feel like after 20 years to suddenly become the world champion? It feels pretty good. I can't say I was actually crying, but I was misting up. Uh, I felt extremely proud that uh, Bobby finally made it, and he was an American, and he had defeated the Soviets. Coming from behind against great odds, against the Soviet machine, it was a wonderful moment. Next up, Fisher stuns the chess world. Fisher just disappeared. No speeches, no giving autographs, and it was to foreshadow what he was going to do for the rest of his life. He stopped playing. He disappeared. After wresting the 1972 World Chess Championship from Russian Boris Spassky, Bobby Fischer returned to America to a hero's welcome. I hope to see more and more Americans playing chess. Chess is a great game. A game and a sport for the mind. The world is Fisher's oyster now. He is set to become a multimillionaire. This symbolically says the king is dead. <laughs> Not yet he isn't. He's offered lucrative sponsorship deals. He's offered huge prize money to appear in tournaments. Doesn't happen. He doesn't make a cent. Bobby turned down nearly every single offer. He won't sign his autograph, let's say, for $100. If you get a dollar and he gets 99 he feels that he's entitled to get it all. Instead, Bobby retreated to Pasadena, California, headquarters of Herbert Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God. Bobby had earned $200,000 for his victory in Iceland. He gave 20% to the church. In exchange, the church rented him an apartment and granted him use of its massive campus. You need a place to stay. You need friends like myself, which I basically introduced him to a number of people that did different things for him. He had uh, access to a car 24-7. Over the next three years, Bobby made few public appearances. In 1975, he was scheduled to defend his world title. Fisher makes 179 demands before he agrees to play Anatoly Karpov. The authorities concede to 177 of them. Fisher sticks to his guns and they make one more concession. It turns out there's only one final sticking point which they can't agree to. Bobby demanded a change in the scoring with draws not counting and the champion needing to win nine games and the challenger ten to take home the title. The proposal was rejected. Fisher won't compromise and so forfeits the World Chess Championship. He could have gone on playing and winning and playing more of these beautiful games. 
God knows how long he could have been world champion. There was huge offers for Fischer to reappear in the, the chess world. It's really hard to understand why he didn't grab some of that money. I mean, it's unfathomable. He had the sense almost of divinity and that no one could tell him what to do. And if he wanted $500,000 to play in a match when, or a million or two million dollars, that's what he wanted. And if you weren't willing to pay the piper, he wasn't going to play. He could have lived any fantasy that a man ever had. In the late 70s, the worldwide Church of God was splintered by leadership scandals. Over time, the church became aligned with more traditional Christian doctrines. But Bobby was long gone. Bobby stopped being involved with people that were reaching out and saying, I want to help you. Stopped taking care of himself, you know, added weight. Essentially, he began the process of isolating himself and retreating into his own world and his own mind and whatever was going on inside of that. One of his opponents said that he wandered around with a suitcase full of Chinese pills because uh, they were going to be antidotes for any poisoning attempt that the Soviets made on him. His paranoia, you know, that everybody was after him. Aye, aye, aye. And then there's a famous surreal incident in 1981 where he is picked up and mistaken for a bank robber and writes a pamphlet I was tortured in a Pasadena jailhouse and it contains various bizarre allegations. He signed it, of course, Robert J. Fisher, World Chess Champion, after, of course, the title had passed on. The title he felt he had always had he never relinquished in his mind. As Bobby disappeared into seclusion, his whereabouts and his actions became a mystery. There were always rumors of him going to bookstores in Los Angeles looking for neo-Nazi books, breaking off relationships with people because they were Jewish. Year after year, Bobby rejected offers to return to the chess world. Then, a teenage girl changed the course of history. A wonderful young woman from Hungary wrote him this terrific letter, beautiful writing, 16 years old. And she said, what are you doing not playing chess? You're the Mozart of the era. You're the Einstein. You're the greatest champion that's ever lived. Why are you not playing anymore? The girl, Zita Roshanyi, became Bobby's pen pal when a Yugoslavian sponsor put up a five million dollar purse to lure Bobby out of retirement Zita convinced him to accept but not everyone liked what they saw he really looked angry at the world all of the time that's, that's my answer In September of 1992, in Sveti Stefan, Yugoslavia, Bobby Fischer played a rematch against Boris Spassky, 20 years after they'd competed for the World Championship. The event was beset by controversy. This was the height of the Yugoslav Civil War, and there were United Nations sanctions which prohibited commercial relations with Yugoslavia. Uh, the United States Treasury Department wrote to Bobby Fischer to warn him about this. Should Bobby choose to play the match and accept his winnings, the penalty would be a $250,000 fine and 10 years in prison. So this is my reply to their order not to defend my title here. That's, that's my answer. <laughs> Bobby ignored the warning and defeated Spassky again. He took the money, more than $3 million, and ran. The warrant was issued against him, which is still in force. And uh, at that point, his wanderings outside the United States began. Bobby went to Hungary with Zita after the championship. He was in love with her. He wanted very much to make it. She took off with another guy. Painful. This was my possibly the only true love. 
Over the next 12 years, Bobby bounced around Europe and Asia. Stuck overseas, he missed the 1997 funeral of his mother, Regina. In the early 1990s, according to um, one just grandmaster who knows them both, uh, they were talking almost every day. Ultimately, he was very close to his mother, and it must have been a great tragedy for him that he couldn't spend those last years with her, that he, he was a fugitive. He first now comes back into the public imagination with these wild anti-American, anti-Semitic rants that he gives on Philippine radio. Well, this is all wonderful news. It's time for the f***ing U.S. to get their heads kicked in. To get the time to finish off the U.S. once and for all. Just say, death to President Bush, I say. Death the United States. F***ing United States. F*** the Jews. The Jews are a criminal people. They mutilate their children. They're a murderous, criminal, thieving, lying bastards. They made up the Holocaust as our word of truth to He was increasingly obsessed with these anti-Semitic issues. He wasn't playing chess anymore. So this was taking up more and more space. He said things like all the Jews in America should be rounded up. I mean, it's horrendous. Close down all the synagogues, arrest all the Jews, execute hundreds of thousands of Jewish ringleaders. Despite having a Jewish mother, Bobby has never considered himself Jewish. His anti-Semitism was a mindset. It was a sort of psychopathic illness, which he couldn't shake off. Probably some hidden or not so hidden antagonism toward his mom, uh, perhaps toward his absent father. In 2002, a stunning secret about Bobby's paternity was discovered. There wasn't a whole lot known about Gerhard Fischer, and when we started digging into it, we discovered that, in fact, Gerhard Fischer had never actually really been part of Bobby's life, that he never actually ever entered the United States. All evidence points to the father being Paul Nemenyi, who was a Hungarian physicist who um, died in the uh, early 1950s. It wasn't clear whether they ever actually told Bobby that Paul was his real father. Beyond the physical resemblance, Bobby and Paul Nemenyi seem to share certain personality traits. Nemanyi was a very interesting character. According to one former co-worker who we interviewed, he had a habit of carrying soap around in his pockets at all times so that he could wash his hands after he touched door handles. He was an animal rights activist. He did not believe in wearing wool. He would occasionally walk around with his pajamas sticking out from underneath his clothing. Bobby appears to have inherited more than just his father's eccentricities. The many had this, as I read, he had this phenomenal spatial ability. He, he apparently thought and looked at issues in ways that no one else did. It was unique. In chess, you have to visualize um, how a board with 64 black and white squares that's filled with um, you know, maybe two dozen pieces, uh, how it might look 10 moves down, down the line. That's all about spatial relations. It really seems like there are a lot of parallels in the way that they thought. There remains one final twist to the revelation of Bobby's biological father. Paul Nemenyi was Jewish. And so Bobby Fischer, arguably the world's most vocal anti-Semite, is the product of not one, but two Jewish parents. Paul Nemenyi's life and career were ruined by the Nazis. He was fired from his university teaching job in Germany because he was Jewish. and. To have a son then who has somehow grasped on to anti-Semitism as a cause is incredibly ironic. The absolute criminals, the Jews, the Jews are behind this, it's a filthy Jew country. The explanation then of Bobby's resentment remains open for debate. I think my father, at the end of the day, he viewed Bobby as a guy who had unfortunately lost his mind. A lot of people think he's mentally ill. I don't think he's mentally ill. He's just become mean. He's become rotten <laughs> inside. Coming up, an American hero languishes in a Japanese jail. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. So he's with me as a gangster. He takes orders from... In July of 2004, after traveling freely for 12 years, Bobby Fischer was arrested in Tokyo for having an invalid passport. Unbeknownst to Bobby, the U.S. had revoked his passport one year earlier. 
This was many years after his, his crime of playing the 1992 match. Why had it taken them so long? One can only assume it was because he'd started making these anti-American comments. The United States is controlled by the Jews. It's a filthy, dirty, rotten country in every way. And it's always been a filthy, dirty, rotten country. Bobby Fischer, I think, was being pursued because of what he said, which, you know, should be anathema to our American ideals of free speech. Month after month, Bobby sat in a Japanese detention center. Lawyers fought to get him free. Salvation would come from an unlikely source. The Icelandic chess authorities, who were very fond of Bobby, and they had never forgotten the debt they owed to him for putting Reykjavik on the map. Bobby Fischer is a part of the Icelandic history now. He became the world chess champion here. This uh, little group was formed, kind of activist, <laughs> free Bobby Fischer uh, group. Bobby became aware of our um, efforts, so he wrote a letter to the foreign minister asking to become an Icelandic citizen. And it was passed with a great uh, maturity. After nine months in captivity, Bobby was released to the Icelandic officials. He traveled 5,500 miles to his new home. Bobby, Bobby. When you saw him arriving at the airport in Iceland, he looked like he had gone to hell and come back. He had been at the edge of the abyss. He was grim, forlorn. He looked broken. Just days after arriving, Bobby held a press conference. Sorry for keeping you waiting. It was nothing but a kidnapping. The Jews told Bush to, uh, to do this. Then Bush told Koizumi to do it. Then the U.S. government and the Japanese government sat down and decided Fisher must go to prison. He must be punished. He must be destroyed. How do you, how do you see things playing out here? Are you, are you going to spend your time here? Are you going to travel? What, what is your name? Jeremy. Jeremy what? Shap. Your father was Dick Shap? He said almost instantly, your father, he was a Jew, right? His father, many, many years ago, befriended me, acted kind of like a father figure. And then later, like a typical Jewish snake, he wrapped me very hard. He said, I don't have a, a sane bone in my body. I didn't forget that. Honestly, I, I don't know that you've done much here today, really, to disprove anything he said. People here were not happy, you know, about Ben Bairi inviting this, you know, raging anti-Semite to come to our country. But since his arrival, Bobby has kept a low profile, doing his best to blend in to the Icelandic landscape. He's very quiet, you know, he's, uh, he's content with himself. He has not made any problems at all here in Iceland, you know. People are leaving him alone, really, and the media is leaving him alone, and I think that's great. I think that's the way it should be. Since childhood, Bobby Fischer has always preferred to be alone. Wasn't it Hamlet that said, I could be bound in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space? And that's what he has done. He has been bound in a nutshell for decades. But all the time he has counted himself a king of infinite space. <laughs> And so, Bobby Fischer, conquering American hero, lives in exile in a modest apartment on a remote island just below the Arctic Circle, alone. When I think about him, I feel very sad indeed. Look what he did to himself. Every game that wasn't played is a tremendous loss in a sense, because it was wonderful to watch him play.
the worst thing in the world, the waste of human potential. For him, for all society.